Jono. Hello. Lovely, lovely to see you here. You're in my yes, study. Lovely to, lovely to be back, as it were. Hope you've got your coffee. I do. I tell you, I made a mistake at the beginning of the show because I always turn my cell phone off, completely off, but I didn't. Um, it was on silent. And you cannot imagine during that video all these messages that I was getting from people. Oh, tell really? him we love him. Yeah, we love him. It's enough already. Come home. Thank you. You know, everybody's just been missing. There's a mi missing, missing you. There's a lot of excitement to see you here. Um, in our living rooms on Coffee and Connecting It. So, oh, hello, Mr. Wood. Can you look at that? Nice Thank you. Lots. I mean, you know, we know that you've been playing to standing ovations in Korea. I'm going to hear more about that. But you have got, as you know, a huge fan base of adoring people in South Africa who are very, very well aware that it's been a long time and <laughs> are waiting for you to come back and uh, perform for us here again. They're very lucky in South Korea. And here's a hell of a story because, in fact, I started by saying, you know, when I say people, we know each other well, and people say, how's Jono and where is he? And, you know, there's a, <laughs> he's in South Korea, you know, at a time like this, playing yeah. to full audiences in a very large theatre, you know, in the longest standing musical, I think mm. it's true to say that Phantom of the Opera is the longest standing musical in the world. And for many people, you know, maybe even for you, it's almost unbelievable in the context of a pandem pandemic. Yeah, I, you know, Jerry, South Africans are very lucky in the sense that we are the most affordable workforce in the world when it comes to musicals. So it means that producers will start a show in South Africa and then tourists around the world, um, you know, Asia, New Zealand, uh, China, uh, sometimes even into Europe with Germany. And I think what people don't realize is as, a, as, as wonderful and as exciting as that opportunity is, because it is, uh, to perform on an international level, you know, you become an ambassador for your own country without even realizing it. And I think to be overseas at this time, um, headlining a musical like this is just, oh, my light's just gone out. How biblical was that? Mm -hmm. that somebody's listening somewhere. Um, to be in, uh, in a position like this at the moment is so terrifying because if you set a step wrong, uh, you know, there are consequences with that, uh, but you have to, you know, do everything right. So the pressure is huge. And then into the mix, you throw the fact that all of your friends all of your colleagues, all of your family are without work and Broadway is shut down and the West End is shut down and people keep saying, oh, it's so inspirational, you're the last remaining light in the world. So as if there wasn't enough pressure before, now we're the, it's, it's kind of like if you're a Star Wars fan, it's like the last hope in a strange way and the pressure on that is huge. But you go out there every night and you look at that audience who are in the theater because they need to be. And it's humbling and it's, I mean, I, I I get emotional sort of five shows out of eight because you look out at that audience and theater is necessary, it's valuable, it's uh, important, it's legitimate. And we don't see that all the time. So that might be a good thing that comes out of all of this. But uh, in the meantime, to, to, to be in this position, I still I still wake up and I, and I, I just think, God, I'm, 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 the, I'm in the only country in the world where musical theater can happen. And I'm not just in any musical, I'm in my dream role with, with, with all these people from around the world. It's, it's the stuff of, 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 of just utter dreamland, quite frankly. No, Jonathan, what you're really highlighting though is I think that you're highlighting that, you know, it's not just stepping in and playing that dream role all the time. You seem to be acutely aware of the fact that you're offering something, you know, that the theatre, that show, you yourself, every show, eight shows a week, are offering something that's important yeah. and offering a gift, you, you, you said, of hope to people, you know, at a time like this where they can immerse themselves, you know, in a unique way when, as say, all of the other theatres all over the world. So you're highlighting the pressure of it. You know, I think many people yeah. would say, you know, oh, yeah, Jonathan has a job and Jonathan is working mm -hmm. and, you know, isn't he lucky? 
And I think that, that actually the pressure isn't focused on what it means to you for you to have that in relation to the rest of the industry. Yeah. You know, there are some parts of it that it aren't easy. What the obligation is in terms of what you're doing, what the fa how it is, when you say you can't put a foot wrong, partly because you're an ambassador for South Africa, the role itself, the, uh, the phantom role, is a really layered, complex role that is of a tormented soul. So that in itself, just immersing into that role in itself, then all of the contextual things. And without, I mean, I'm going to ask you, do you hug <laughs> there? Does you know, without the, the physical contact and certainly not the physical contact of people that you know very well and love. You know, yeah. it's looked as anti-lucky, but I think there is the other side of it. Yeah, um, you see, the, 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 the Korean government is, is very much in, in partnership with the, the local producers as well as the really useful group in, in London. And as a company, you know, you get to the stage door, you have your temperature checked, you sanitize your hands, you greet people, you know, with a, with a Cyril handshake, which I still laugh about. Um, there's none, and you know, theatre people are affectionate people. Um, you know, if you meet somebody for the first time, it's a hug. It's just the way theatre people are. We we can't do that, and th that's the hardest thing because it affection is second nature to most theatricals. You know, um, but the issue is, you know, okay, so off stage we can control that. What happens on stage? And Raoul and Christine still kiss. The fans and Christine still kiss. Um, but there is such a good monitoring of health and a, uh, an open communication with everybody. The minute anybody is uncomfortable with that, it comes up for discussion. Um, you know, the, the other opportunity that we had afforded to us is we could, um, you know, lighting could be changed that we could turn in silhouettes. So it looks like we're kissing because in the theater, lots of things can appear to be some one thing when they actually aren't. So it's easier in the theater. God help us if this was a movie. But um, we have, I think where we've lucked out the most, aside from being, you know, extraordinarily lucky with timing, is we have a group of people and we have a group of producers who are completely transparent, who keep us in the loop of everything and are in daily contact with the Korean government, who are laying down the law and are producing the results. Um, you know, you, you can't argue with that. No. So from that point of view, you have a, you have a very... Uh, reassured company of uh, people who can be slightly dramatic from time to time. Oh, oh I'm sure and that's an understatement. It's <laughs> in, yeah, very dramatic from time to time. Um, but I mean, it's interesting that dynamic have a happening in the context of Korea. I think the perception is that there's a kind of a restraint. There is a not very emotionally expressive. So it'd be interesting to hear your uh, telling us about how the audience are responding. You know, I mean, do you get those that that huge clapping and standing ovations, and the affection part of it? You know, the, that needing to be restrained. You said actually comes into the cast, um, certainly on stage, but off stage as well. So for you, you know, who's far away from home and not having that kind of access, um, would you, how would you say the whole thing is affecting maybe you personally a little, a little bit and the performance? Because most especially as the Phantom, there's extensive makeup, which takes a really long time. You have to get to the theatre probably long before most of the other cast. And, and leave later. So does that mean that you're spending uh, more time than you would usually? Well, I mean, if I, if, I, if I were to compare this to Chicago, which I did in 2018, um, I arrived with the cast. I left with the cast. I was around the cast. I was, I was very much part of the company. Um, and, you know, the caveat to this next statement is by no means am I complaining. I, as far as I'm concerned, I had the best job in the world. Uh, I wanted to go on as long as possible, and I adore it. But what people don't realize, I think, is a role like the Phantom um, is so lonely. 
oh. because you don't see anybody. And I think there have been a lot of people before me who were, um, there's, a, there's a medical term for them, I think it's pricks, who have ruined the idea that the phantom can be a human being off stage as well. They've lived the role, they've been difficult, they've been hard with the company. Um, obviously along the line there have been exceptions to that rule, but there's a, a stigma to whoever plays the phantom that they need silence and they need to be alone because they need to be prepared. And anybody who's worked with me knows that I'm not that actor. I'm that actor who is texting friends before a big scene, who is chatting and laughing and making a joke in the wings before I go on and burst into tears because that's where we need to be in the story. I, I, I'm not a method actor and I think there have been lots of method actors who've gone too far with the role that have resulted in anybody playing the phantom being easily the most lonely person in the show. Well, you see, I now you leave do. the door open with a sign on it that says, please come in. Yeah. I feel like an abandoned dog at the SPCA desperate for a new yeah. owner at times because you just want that contact. And I think most people in the world who have been in, in quarantine or isolation can, for the first time, unanimously relate to the phantom, knowing what it's like to be locked up, wishing that they could be part of the world. So. The extension of what I'm trying to say is I'm hoping that there is a phoenix effect, that once the theatres are open, um, once the stadiums are open, once the restaurants are open, they will be filled with people seeing it almost for the first time, experiencing it for the first time, and appreciating it for the first time in the way that it should be. Because everything that involves people should be collaborative, whether it's, you know, recreational, whether it's theatrical, whether it's sports or or, or culinary, any, any of those worlds, it's important that there is a collaboration between those two energies because that is what gives us that thrill. That's why theater, or, you know, theater actors do it all the time. Um, we're not just Roxy Hearts at hope, at, at heart. There's a hope there that there will be a collaboration all the time. So who knows, this might be the best thing for the business. Well, it really might be, you know, because what you're saying is, and what I've found in, in what I do, is that mental health per se, and having all of these feelings that are associated with isolation, have really been destigmatized yeah. because so many people are feeling them. So they're talking about loneliness and frustration and uncertainty and isolation and sadness. And it's really fascinating for me for all of us to listen to the fact that that really is the epitome of what phantom is all about mm -hmm. it's about discrimination and having to hide away but without shutting off the longings of the heart at the yes. same time and so perhaps there will be a renewed you know expansion of vision of the phantom being reminiscent of what a lot of people have experienced throughout this. That's, it's uh, absolutely fascinating to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. And that you, you know, also living this and having your door open and know, knowing, you know, that as human beings, we are wired for connection and that you're a really yeah. long way. Having said that, of course, there is the wonder of it, the timing of it, you know, the joy of oh. it. You know, just, you know. I'm glad you said timing because I, I believe that that's exactly what this is. You know, it can easily be, you know, insulting to distill this down to luck. But, yeah. uh, you know, one of, the, one of the big people in the business back home, Peter Turin, taught me that there's no such thing as luck. It's all about timing. Huh. And you want to talk about timing. As a, as, a, as a production, we left Busan just before corona was a thing we got into korea just after they got it under control uh, we are here now as the numbers are getting lower and lower and lower it's incredible to think that if we were two weeks out we would have to close the show probably that said yeah. even if we were here two weeks early the way that the rules and the guidelines have been followed because they've had you know, a, 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 they've had a longer time on their arc with this. The, the understanding and the treatment and the no-nonsense policy with a population who follows the rules is why we're, we're where we are at the moment. It's, it's extraordinary to think. Mm -hmm.
Sure. And so that's made all of the difference. It's a population who follows the rules. It's meticulousness. You know, absolutely in um, just getting it under control. It's the science behind it. It's the yeah. execution behind it. And it's the um, it's the, the kind of collaboration of everyone who recognizes the importance of it for everybody else. So that kind of statement of we all do it, we, we all in it together. It's There's an understanding of, of, of what there is to lose. And I think yeah. that's the big... Uh, it, you know, if you were to prioritize everything, it's all very well going, well, what am I going to miss out on? What am I going to have to sacrifice for two weeks in quarantine? It's yeah. an understanding of what the worst case scenario could be. And taking every precaution to prevent Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Well, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's much more than timing. It's dedication. And it's a lot of research. It's translating that knowledge into extreme action every day. Yes. And you are there headlining it. And, you know, to, everybody's very proud of you from here, Jonathan, for being in it. And I think it's also important that people understand, you know, what, what that journey really is and what it means. I mean, for the people there, um, and we're talking about you in particular, when you look at that reel, that um, Brian put together for us, Brian Schimmel, our producer, for this. I mean, I know a lot of them and, and witness just, you know, with joy and awe, a lot of those roles that you have played. But when you see it like that, you know, just together, the diversity um, of those roles, the journey that you've been on, and we just need to look at you, you know, you're not an old, you're not an old man. You've had the most illustrious career, I guess, in theatre speak, in theatre speak, in a relatively short period of time. I know that you started your career when you were still at school, but to have had those roles, and most of them have been leading roles, a lot of them have been your own innovative creations in terms of concepts and things that you have written. I think it's kind of, you know, it's it's like you've never stopped working since you started this, and you've been on this journey. So, I mean, it's, can you just tell us no, a little bit about how it all it's started? Not not that I've not stopped working, it's that I've met the right people that have inspired me to not want to stop working. Because um, it's easy for me to stand back and say, oh yes, that was all me. But the, the stark reality is, um, and by no means do I want to seem like one of those self-deprecating and like ingratiating, oh, it's all about my people. The, the fact is, my chosen profession is a collaborative one. For it to be successful, you need to collaborate with people. As somebody who is, I think, innately lonely, of course I'd be drawn to that process because I, I, I'm suddenly meeting people who think the way I do or can help me think better the way I'd like to. So, you know, I started off in Northcliffe High School and there was a grumpy, cantankerous guy there called Nick Yordan who took such a leap of faith with me and cast me in, in his major productions, which were then tours of the Natal Playhouse, because we had a visionary principal who said that if the rugby boys can go on tour, so should the drama boys. So we would go on tour for two weeks into Durban at the Natal Playhouse and run as a professional company so that we could see what it was like and like, will we fit into that as a job, as a, as a vocation? And I did five musicals there. And Nick Yordan, I think, recognized one of my big weaknesses, and that is that I'm an absolute slut for applause, and I would have done anything to get an audience to clap for me. And he, he, he did his best, I think, to try and get that out of me. I think he succeeded 75%, but the, the whore in me is just immortal, I think. And um, I, I learned a lot from it. And, and in retrospect, I, I think about things he used to say to me and things he used to do to try and get me to snap out of it. Um, that I, I still think are valuable. And he's still doing it at Northcliffe High School now. We, we, we don't speak all that often anymore, but um, he certainly uh, is responsible for a large chunk of why I'm here. Sure. Um, you know, just what I love is that, that um, one of the things is that you can say that where most people feel it but won't say it. You know, I think that why are you on the stage? I mean, there are lots of reasons. There are many, and we can go into, you know, what it means to me. To, but I don't know 
anybody, never mind actors, who, you know, aren't just where recognition is like salt. Recognition and how do you get the recognition in terms of feedback, but every day, hopefully, every night, in terms of the applause, which is affirming to you, to yeah. what you do. And who would not want that? I don't think that people, you know, many people would put it as graphically to say that I'm a real slut for it and a whore, but I think every, no, I think that you every- You for it, aren't I? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And honestly, it, it, Dorian, it, it's it's more empathy. Yeah. I, I have been on the receiving end of somebody taking taking credit for my work without including me in that process or that appreciation. And I know how that made me feel. And I will never let somebody feel like that at my hand. So that's where that comes from. It, it it's not it's not sort of blind nobility, it's empathy, because I felt like garbage when that was done to me. So I certainly won't do that to somebody else. Is, but, was that um, me, Jono. I mean, you know, we, that kind of recognition and um, care and awareness of other people, and um, and and their feelings and and the way you relate to them, the how how that affects them. I mean, when you started off this, so you said that you went into it sounded like that you depicted yourself as quite lonely from a child, and you went into this and and that you wanted it. so. Was that something that became more and more important? Yes, I'd say so. Um, theatre makes a person a misfit. And then you find out that, you know, that those drama kids in school that you remember um, are now part of an industry, one of the few industries that cannot be replaced by machinery. All these years later, there's a, there's a little bit of justice for me because I remember sitting in class and having would-be law students or doctors or accountants, you know, saying, you know, you, your job is more of a hobby. Mine's a real job. And then I read the papers today and I see that more and more of those professions are being replaced by robots. It's like Star Wars. Second Star Wars reference for the interview. The third one's coming soon. And in, in, in many ways, I think people... Under it, the underdog is always the most successful victory because we were those weird, overweight, pimply kids who could put on voices and imitate people. And now people are, are, are falling over themselves to see us do our thing because there's nothing like it in the world. And there's a bit of, there's a bit of satisfaction in that for me because I was lonely and then I went into the theater and I met 300 other people who were like me. And I didn't think that was going to be possible because I'd been conditioned into thinking that I was the only one like me and I should change, otherwise I should shut up. And my physical drawbacks made me feel unattractive even on a human level. But then I went into the theatre where, as we know, you have the most interesting looking human beings in the world. And then you feel you're, you're, that you're part of a community of people who are special. And they make you a better version of yourself without compromise. So it's a win-win situation. And then you start meeting people like, for instance, you know, Nick was the beginning of it in Northcliffe High School. But then I, I was given an audition for the first production that I ever was in. That was Greece, um, two weeks before I wrote my trick. And that was going to be at the Barnyard Theatre. It was directed by a man whose name I recognize from the papers because of fundraisers for his kids. And that's Ian Von Memerty. And I said to my mother at the time, I want to go and audition because I just want to meet him. Because I know that there's this show called A Handful of Keys. Because all my neighbors used to talk about it, but we couldn't afford to get tickets to go and see it. And I went along and I saw this man across the room and I, and I just thought, wow, that's the, that, that's the guy. Okay. And there I am to sing Beauty School Dropout for him. And okay. he cast an 18-year-old, overweight, pimply guy who could go yeah, 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 at the end of the song and i was in the th i was part of the theater and you know my mother said you know take a gap year it's now what's this 2020 it's it's been a 15 year long gap year now but you know i met i i, I met ian and i the, he has a different version to the story than i do but i remember him saying to me during a rehearsal once of Greece, um, how about you do a handful of keys? And I, his version of the story is that I went to him and said, please, can I do a handful of keys? So either way, a handful of keys was mentioned. And the following year, 2008, there I was 
in the show that I'd heard about as this legend, and we toured the country on and off for eight years. And I was suddenly part of something that had an original South African theatrical history to it. Wow. That, that cannot be lost on anybody coming into the theatre. Um, if you are as nerdy, as passionate, and as obsessive as I have had to confess that I am. Because there I was with my name attached to a show that people would recognize when my name was mentioned because it was in brackets after my name in the future. Oh. It gave me a platform. It gave me uh, credibility. It gave me legitimacy in the business because suddenly there was this kid who was 21 in a handful of keys and the kid can play and he can sing and he, he kind of looks all right. So oh. people started coming to the show. And one of the presenting houses of that was the Monte Cassino Theatre, which is owned by Peter Turin. And I met another name who I'd seen only in papers or on posters. And the, the way that that worked is it, it all sort of came together because I had Ian with a handful of keys that was also written with Brian Schimmel, who's watching as we know, but he was also going to be the musical director on Beauty and the Beast. That was going to be produced by Hazel and Peter. So everything went like this. And I found myself in a room auditioning with, bless his dear, beautiful soul, Sabura Debe. Um, sure. I beg your pardon. That is um, yes, uh, because yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm taken back to a, a sports club where Sabu and I were auditioning for Beauty and the Beast as Gaston and Le Fou, and it was on that audition that we both got the role. And he's not with us anymore, and it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing. But there was Peter. I'm so sorry. I don't know what this is about. This is this is this, this is not like me at all. I'm not emotional at all. Um, and I was doing a handful of keys for five weeks in Cape Town. This is one of my favorite stories to tell. And the middle three weeks, they were going to. Well, sorry, I was doing a handful of keys in Cape Town. Beauty and the Beast was rehearsing in Johannesburg for five weeks. The middle three weeks, I would be doing a handful of keys in Cape Town, because it was a small role. I I cockily turned to the producers and said, I'll tell you what, since Gaston's only in five scenes, I'll fly up for the days you need me and I'll go back to Cape Town. So for three weeks, I would wake up at 4 a.m., fly to Johannesburg to be at rehearsal by half past nine, leave rehearsal at four to be in Cape Town by six, to be at Theatre of the Bay by seven, to do a show of Handful of Keys at eight. I did that for two weeks. Um, and then they added the extra week. So it was three weeks in total. I was the thinnest Gaston they'd ever had in, in Disney was concerned. But I think that that willingness, I mean, these were the days when one time airlines were still a thing. That's, that's how old it was. I think Peter and Ian, both as producers of, of the various shows that I was part of, could recognize that I needed to do this. It's not that it was fun. It's not that I wanted to. It's not that I liked to. I needed to do this. Between those two productions, Beauty and the Beast and A Handful of Keys, I was given, I think, the greatest gift in the theater, and that is faith. Because producers suddenly had faith in me that I would produce for them, deliver for them, that I was as in love with the process as they were, um, and that I was crazy enough to stay. And from there on, it's been the most incredible ride. But I, I have to underline those 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 pillars who were responsible for where I am now. So look, I mean, you are renowned, but it's not. It's just a fact for having exceptional talent and diversity. We just needed to take a look at that show reel, and you have so many people here who follow your every move. Um, but but you know the fact is that there are a huge number of people who are really talented, exceptional number here and all over. There's something else, the X factor. I mean, you know, not everybody who's talented gets that kind of break, not only recognition. Um, and and you know you've mentioned things like passion and crazy and need uh, and so on. If you could say part of the the secret of success such a cliche you know it's just doesn't really do it but but you know the fact that I have been recognized and I do play these roles and you are where you are now would you say that it was that the passion the 
the need, the craziness, obviously the talent that goes without saying. Can you highlight? I, yeah. I, I, I paraphrase a lot of musicals subconsciously because I, I, I just adore them. Um, I think my edge is the chip on my shoulder that I have that I never studied. I don't have a piece of paper in my office that says I may do what I do for a living or that I'm qualified to do what I do for a living. I always felt that, and I still do if I'm honest with you, that I have to work three times as hard as anybody else who has a, has a degree in the theater because they deserve to be there. I have to prove myself a little harder to stay you know, it's, it's not like, you know, when you get part of the, when you get your membership to this exclusive club, you're not in there forever. You have to keep proving yourself. There's like a, a monthly review. And I think my, my genuine love for it as an art form, as a sanctuary for people like me, as a statement in times that we're in right now, um, there, there, there is a huge privilege to that, but there is a, a responsibility to keep it as as pure and as perfect as possible. That Which means lots of, work. lots of work. Lots of I mean, there's that, you know, and this I think is really true. You know, we call it the 99, 99% 9, perspiration, 1% inspiration. Oh, yes. And that you're talking about the inspiration you have to have the 99 counts for nothing unless you have that kind of you have that's that's the benchmark but after that and it's you know through knowing you quite well and now listening to you now um it is like you never stop working and you take it very seriously and as you come to the end of something you're already envisaging the next is always the next do you relax <laughs> There's a drawback to that because it means you never really appreciate things in the moment. Because if I think back to the last three years that I was in South Africa, I was gratefully moving on from project to project to project to project. But what that meant is that I could never really enjoy the final night of any one of those projects. Because the final night was the day before tech of the new one. Yeah. And what that meant is I had conditioned myself into obsessing about the future, but never ever seeing the present. And in doing so, my self-esteem really took a, a beating to the point that even during one of my concerts, I actually lost my voice because I was exhausted, I was ill, I was burnt out, my heart was empty, uh, my, my ability to... Um, believe in what I that in, it, believe that what I was bringing to the table was enough was gone and that was a big lesson a big a, a necessary lesson for me um, but one that I never want to repeat again because I do believe you should love your work but the minute that you're in love with your work you hand over all of your power and your humanity to something that you really shouldn't because it needs you to be a whole person to deliver the best. Absolutely. And the theater is about emulating human behavior. At the end of the day, in terms of the actors, it's about emulating human behavior. If you are not a whole human being, you cannot do your job. So uh, I learned the importance of self-care from that. Did you really though? I, I, mean, I really I don't think, think I did. I mean, because um, what, what do you think um, is going to, I mean, that was a very, very powerful experience. And yet, you know, you got up onto the stage again the next night when, um, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't have, there's no judgment. I'm just, <laughs> just talking about the fact it was huge. It was at Monte Casino, there were many people, it was booked out, it was a full orchestra, everything. Maybe you felt that there was, I think you did, that there was absolutely no alternative, but you were offered. The choice of cancelling the concert. You got, you did, and you got up there again. And I just want to know how you're going to um, kind of not let suffering go to waste. And have yeah. you learned the lessons, and what are you doing differently? I, 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 I mean, I, I think I understand what you mean. It's the thing about the theatre is 
you know, Doctor Footlights is is very much a thing because there's this there's this legend that uh, if you if you break a leg during a performance, you can finish that performance because you won't feel it until the applause is finished. Because that curtain comes down, the applause dies down, and the real world comes back in and goes, "Hello," and th that's a that's a big part of it. Um, I also do believe that your last, you know, you're only as good as your last performance. And I thought to myself, well, I can't let this be the last, because I was going away on a big international tour. And I thought, is this how I want to be remembered? Is this what I've worked for all these years as the last memory? Um, and the answer was obviously no. But there were other people involved that you don't want to let down either, because the theater becomes a family. It's, and, and for people like myself, who don't have huge families, um, that vicarious torture becomes addictive. You don't realize it in the moment, but you're replacing you know, whole, you're trying to replace holes in your family tree with sort of cuttings of your collaborators. And that doesn't always work because it's not their job and it's not your, your place to do that. It's to build a new kind of family, not to fill in the gaps because you will only appreciate your new family by acknowledging what those gaps look like in your old family tree. Sure. And, and for me, that was the big turning point for me because I, 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 I stopped trying to fill up all the holes in my sinking Titanic with, you know, jelly. Um, and the, so and the reality the line that you've just reminded me of that has come to mind, and I haven't thought of it for some time, I think it was from The Greatest Showman, mm. where um, one of the performers who's been on show it was the lady who's been shown off in inverted commas as a bit of a freak show, you know, all the way and yes. through. And she gets these standing ovations. And I think the very poignant line was, no ovation can fill the hole. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And, and that's reminiscent. So I'm just wondering yeah. about all of the new families. I mean, the family becomes the show you in at the moment. Yeah. What would you say about um, either the lack of or the maintenance of, for you, the importance of sustained relationships in your life? I think the difficulty with any industry in, well, uh, theatre industries in any country is that so quickly colleagues become competitors instead of collaborators. And what that means is that the audience is cheated out of extraordinary product that would only have been possible through collaboration. Mm -hmm. Because I might have a show in mind, and then this person has another show in mind, but the show that the two of us could create together is better than either one solo. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, I think ultimately, you know, even, even stuff like recognition, whether it is an award, whether it is a standing ovation, whether it is a full house, whether it is a 25% house, either way, there's an element of competitiveness that creeps in that almost turns us against one another and we don't realize it in the moment. And months later, once you've cooled down and your ego's taken a backseat, you go, God, I wonder what I missed out on. Yeah. And, and I think that we have to be mindful of that, especially now. Um, I've done, you know, a, a lot of thinking on my own, either in lockdown, quarantine, isolation, whatever, whatever anybody is, is in. It's a golden opportunity to just step back and just have a look at how things have come into your life and perhaps why. And there's no other industry more important to do that in than in the theatre, I think. And on top of it all, um, if you think about a musical, there are very few musicals that it's just one person who you remember. You remember moments between actors. You remember big production numbers between an entire ensemble. It's, it's the interaction between us that's magical. Very few of us are magical on our own. That becomes boring. Yeah. It's, that, it's that electricity. So I think that you're reflecting, and very importantly, because, you know, as you say it, you, you might not recognize, you know, that you are influential and people are listening very carefully because it gives them permission to stop, re-examine their goals, where they've been, about relationships perhaps that 
where there isn't the kind of clean space that you want to have. That perhaps, you know, we're very important to you and you make amends. I mean, you're talking about things personally in a, in a very important way because that is what people are going through now. So there's so much that we can talk about personally, but I don't want to leave out these moments. I mean, and there's so many of this most illustrious, Career. I mean, you just stepped into a handful of keys, and the kids, could, the kid could play and sing. You weren't born playing the piano. I mean, was that a passion and a love from the beginning, and the singing? And then out of you know these roles, I don't even know if they are highlights because they all highlights. You know, can you say something about the career and the theatre journey, and the yeah. meaning of all of that to you? I actually don't like the word highlight because it implies others are lowlights. Yeah, I guess. Um, you know, it, it's, it's almost like singling certain people out. It, it implies that you're leaving others out. But I think the highlight of my career has, has been the opportunity to create. And most theatre performers are accustomed to, and this is absolutely fine, obviously, to just going from show to show to show and reinterpreting other people's work. And that certainly is one of the bedrocks of our industry. Where I have found um, a lot of joy is creating new things. So a show about Marvin Hamlish, for instance, called I'm Playing Your Song. Marvin Hamlish was the composer of a chorus line, and he did the music to The Sting and The Way We Were. And on one night, he won three Oscars. He's the only person in the world that's ever done that. He's the most famously unknown composer uh, in, in the musical theater slash the, the, the film world. So, you know, Peter Turin said, well, I think that that's a, that's a great idea for a show. Why don't you do it? And we wrote it and we developed it with Alan Swerdlow. Um, you know, in terms of the script, it was, it was amazing to do that. I then did the same thing with Liberace, with Ian Von Memerty. Then I did the same thing with Jerry Lee Lewis, with Wesley Lauder. Then I did the same thing with Flanders and Swan, with, with Alan again. And... Gilbert and Sullivan, and, and all of these different varied uh, musical theater entities, um, you know, we were able to create stuff that was ours. And we, we, I got to feel, I suppose, what it, what it feels like, you know, when you're on Broadway and you write a new musical and you put it out there and you let the audiences come and judge it and then you let the critics come and judge it and then it runs or it doesn't. And then it has a, a, a different life and you, you learn things from that. And ultimately, I could not have done that when I first started. I needed to get to a certain place before I could do that because when I started out as Gaston in Beauty and the Beast, I was suddenly playing a role that was appreciated for how beautiful he was, which was something I was not accustomed to being the fat kid in high school. Subsequently, I was extraordinarily arrogant and unapproachable. I was a dickhead. I'm so sorry, but that's the only term for it. And in retrospect, I realized that that's what I was because I had no understanding of how, what my behavior was doing to my, my co-workers, cast, crew, orchestra, whatever. I was just drunk on this new acceptance. And it was only by the time, I, I suppose, when I ironically was playing Judas and Jesus Christ Superstar in 2011, that I started opening my eyes to what my behavior was doing to people. It was alienating them. It was never a, a deliberate thing. I was just enjoying the party way too much, but it was my party, and I was the only one at the party. And that's why I realized how important collaboration was, because then you start seeing other people, and you realize that the musical theater is not for me, it's for us. Mm -hmm. yeah, Okay. And, 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 and there's an echo. Brian, I've got Brian. an echo. His name is Brian. <laughs> yeah, I just call him for me. It's a term of, infect, of, of infection, affection. <laughs> so, so okay. So, um, you went through those years, and son, it's like it's kind of like the story of the ugly duckling, but taken further. Sure. And he does it on steroids, you know, and you look in the mirror and you say, okay, I mean, no, this is nice, what happened? Yeah. And and all of that that came with it. And it's been a journey and it's, I mean, I think that the um, position and the humility, you know, you are talking about and the recognition very much in terms of it being a collaborative industry. So, you, 
every time, I mean, you've spoken about a lot of things that you developed and wrote in collaboration with everyone else. It was an acknowledgement of um, composers and musicians and luminaries right. that you, um, you had admired and you were tributing them all the time. In addition, you were putting yourself out there because this was your work. Yeah. And there's a risk involved in it. Yeah. And I mean, I think yeah. if I could have changed one thing in, in my short journey up to where I am now, it's that I would have shown the gears and the cogs a bit more to other people because I was so fiercely protective about letting anybody see the process. And I think the unnatural drawback of that is that people assume that it's easy for me. Mm. They never see me sweating. They never see me bursting into tears because I don't know how I'm going to do this. I can't get this right. They never see me practicing. I always did that behind closed doors and hidden away because I, I, I just I needed to be on my own to create that. And that has, has led to this idea amongst some of my colleagues that Jonathan doesn't really work hard. He just, he does it and he's lucky because he's got, he's got you know, producers in his back pocket or he's sleeping with them or so. There's always an idea and the perception, whether it's correct or not, people need a perception. And I think people were going on what they were given. They didn't have the information because I was holding it like this. Don't see me practice. Don't see me get a song wrong, for God's sake. Um, and it led to this unnatural and incorrect view of, of, of what I'm like to the degree that when I was working on projects in 2018, people would say, oh, you also struggle? And I was like, come on, come on. So, but that, that just shows you, you know, Jonathan, that come on means it really just shows you that, uh, I mean, they never, ever saw that. So I think that what you're saying is if you would do it differently now, maybe show some more, I mean, challenging their perception also goes with revealing imperfection and vulnerability. Yes. And it goes, the, the two go together. Are you, are you more comfortable with doing that? Are you prepared to do some of that now for the sake <coughs> of challenging the perception? Or maybe you're just saying, okay, we'll just think what you like. Yeah, I think um, the more I'm doing this, the more I'm realizing that I am not my work. Um, my work is what I do, and it's a part of me, but it, it, it's not me. And if I get something wrong in the rehearsal room, I mean, that said, to be fair, anybody you know who was in the rehearsal room during Chicago, <laughs> Brian Schimmel, will remember the, 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 the vague tantrums I would throw when I couldn't get certain rhythms right in a, in a specific courtroom scene. But I'm working on it. I am working on it because it's, it's the idea of I never, ever want to seem ungrateful for the position that I'm at, that I find myself in. Let me put it that way, because I think one of the cardinal sins in our business is ill preparation or lack thereof, because it's, it's, it's just plain disrespectful. Um, the very least you can do if you, if you are honored with a role in a musical like Chicago is to arrive on day one with your words down, with your music down, um, so that you know you you start with the express understanding that you appreciate where you are, because there are so many people who could do what you do. Nobody's irreplaceable. Nobody's truly um, special to the degree of uh, singularity. That doesn't exist. If that did, we wouldn't have a theatre industry because we've dominated by the same three people for fifty years. Um. So. That, that, that in itself, I think, was my goal in the beginning, but it, it turned into this weird sort of Frankenstein obsession that I had because I cannot be seen as getting this wrong because then they're all going to say, you see, it's because he didn't study. Oh. Whereas now I'm going, I, I've put in a good 15 years of this acting thing. <laughs> um if people have to study for four years in university, I've, I've, you know, I've added on an extra 11 for compensation plus tax. So I think we're even. Mm -hmm. Now I can, I can deal with people as though I'm their equal. Mm -hmm. sure. I'm not below them anymore. So, so you caught up to that. There's no gap anymore. Yes, I think that's, that's how I'm starting to feel. I'm not there yet. I, I'm working on it, but it's how I'm starting to feel. Sure.
So in terms of where you are now, I mean, there it is, and it is an unreal situation. I know that you've referred to it because you're acutely aware of what's happening in all of the rest of the world. Yeah. The theatre industry are coming out in the most creative way, and in an innovative way, kind of with a degree of acceptance, not permanent acceptance, but present acceptance, that this is how we are right now. And yeah. certainly in quite a number of countries, this is going to be the case for a while. We are not on the stage receiving that kind of um, affirmation live with the energy and the connection of those live audiences. So what you've seen explosions are that these really creative and innovative coming together of artists, of um, various videos, of getting together, of reminiscing like that have here on and scene, um, even of this platform, you know, the recognition that there is a community and that people want to connect and yes. many are isolated. Also, um, as you said, you know, the acute recognition that, you know, there are many people who, who if they don't work, don't get paid. And that yeah. kind of, you know, so, I mean, that is that. And there, and, and so it is a bit of a bubble, the kind of bubble with not a cutting off bubble, an aware bubble of what's going on. So there was something, there was a wonderful article in the New York Times this week with a picture yes. of you having your makeup, uh, you know, at the mirror in Korea, yeah. um, at the theatre where they explained everything. And there was something in there which was fascinating, saying, look, you know, it's kind of been more than an experiment. It's been a very, very considered scientific and um, exercise that seems to be working, you know, to a degree. There was some thought of trying in some time to export that methodology into other theatres. I think there was one in London that was mentioned particularly. Yes. So how do you see the movement? I mean, in South Africa, we have added difficulties, especially in terms of money and the ability to, 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 to do all of those measures and so on. But when you look at your industry going forward now. I think, do you know what? I think it's uh, above everything else, what it comes down to, is how how strong is the collective response going to be because that's what it comes down to um you know the korean response the british response the american response are all specific to the regions that they're in at the end of the day um I like to think that the, the, the desire for survival and uh, perseverance is strong enough and stronger than the doubting of whether or not this is going to work or not, because that's what it needs to be. Um, being all the way over here, it may seem easy for me to say that because, well, he's in Korea, so he's okay, Jack. Um, what people don't realize is the survivor's guilt and the element of that here because I see what's happening to my friends, my family, my colleagues, people that I was working with three years ago that I see their posts on Facebook now and I cannot believe that they're saying certain, certain things uh, because that's their world at the moment and one wants to try and help. But I, I, I think the point is um, there, there's so much that one can and cannot say, but the bottom line is it's possible. The way it's going to happen will have to be different in every place but it's possible um yeah. I, I i don't know how necessarily but i do know that the technology is it thank god we're in 2020 not 1930 because dear god can you imagine where we'd be technologically back then where we are now the ability for it the infrastructure and the know-how of it um we are in the best position we possibly could be hmm. so John, I mean, we're looking at all of that. You say there's no particular highlight. I mean, memories of every production that you've been in, some a, a, a memory or something that just comes to mind immediately that influenced you, that might have been a defining moment. You certainly spoke about the uh, what happened on the concert, maybe something that was just unbelievably positive or affirming and i'm sure there were so many moments maybe it's an unfair question too um 
and also ask him. I think, to, to, yeah. to be honest, the first concert that I did, uh, well, 2017, we were doing the musicals in concert at um, Monte Cassino, and I was walking past the box office to go uh, to the dressing room to put my suit on to go and sing. It was a Sunday matinee, and there was a line of people trying to get tickets to come in, and we were sold out. And um, and I remember looking at that line going, they're not coming to see a musical or someone else's work. They're coming to see me. And a lady stood at the box office and said, but I want to see Jonathan. Hmm. She didn't say, I want to see the Phantom or Sweeney Todd. She said me by name. And I, I was taken back to the first musical I did in nursery school, which was The Wizard of Oz. I was a munchkin, the God, largest munchkin you've ever seen. I was a bit like King Kong. But I remember afterwards, a lady looked at me and said, oh, you were that munchkin. And I thought, oh, she saw me. And I remember feeling the same way outside the box office of Monte Cassino. And then I went and sang for 1,900 people with a full orchestra. And I went home that night and I, th and I, I was terrified because I thought, I don't think it's going to get better than this. Sure. And can you embrace those moments now to say, look, they do want to see me? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now the point is I just need to get back home and do another concert because I'm, I, I miss performing at home. Sure. I really do. On the cards for you now, just as we wrap up. Well, um, we, we're here un until August, uh, October. We've just extended here. We're also going to Daegu. We're doing a season there, and our season in Taiwan has also been announced, which is wonderful. So Phantom is just kicking Corona's butt wherever it goes. Thank God. Good for Phantom, and good. Maybe for we you. should bring it to South Africa. Then it can kick Corona's butt there as well. Well, you've put the thought out there, you know. <laughs> The thought is now out there, and yes. uh, yeah, we'll Good see. Break. We'll see about the, the response. Test. John, it's been fantastic talking to you, everybody. Not even an hour just flew by, just like that. It's like I'm literally I mean, each of those things that are your your career has been fantastic. You've highlighted that it's been backed up. You you are recognizing the collaborative nature of your industry. You've said thank you to people who've been um, extremely influential with you. And uh, you certainly have developed, it's not about all of the shows, it really has been about you. You've got a huge fan base now all over the world and here. And um, I think that it's been amazing to see you like this without the mask, although you were probably the first to have the mask on before anybody else, which is quite <laughs> ironic. So for me, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And a pleasure and a privilege. And uh, we will be watching and following with interest. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.